Hey everyone, welcome back from lunch. We're gonna get started here with uh, John McDonough who's gonna talk about uh, becoming an Ansible uh, contributor. Perfect. That's me. <laughs> hey everybody, uh, listen, let's give everybody some room, all right? <laughs> Pull it in a little bit. Now I know you got here first and that's the seat you chose, but the people that came later obviously couldn't get here on time and so we have to give them the seat that they prefer. That's my pet peeve at the movie theater. All right, if you want that seat, you should have been here. Um, how, to be an Ansible, how to be an Ansible contributor. Is anybody here an Ansible contributor? Good, now no one will question what I'm talking about. Um, or Ansible contribution how to. <clears throat> I am John McDonough, like Paul said, I'm a developer evangelist for Cisco, and I work mainly with data center automation and specifically targeting compute, um, and we recently launched a Ansible set of modules for UCS compute, for which I'm a contributor. This talk has nothing to do with UCS or compute or anything like that. Come on in, there's, there's a few seats left. Just find some space and uh, be sure to take a seat directly in front of somebody because <laughs> that's gonna be good. All right, so I'm John McDonough. I work for Cisco DevNet. I'm gonna read this in third person because that's the way you write your bio. John writes code, John talks about code, John talks about writing code, and mostly the code that I write is okay, and I talk pretty good, I mean well, and I contribute to Ansible. And if you'll notice, the background of my slides are Black. not purple like those losers. <laughs> All right, here's the agenda we're gonna to cover today, so pull up a chair, a pillow. A cup of coffee. We're going to talk about what do I know about Ansible, and you, you'll be surprised at what I know about Ansible. Uh, we'll talk about reading some docs. We'll talk about forking Ansible on GitHub. I know it sounds bad, but it's not that bad. We'll set, talk about setting up a developing, development environment, reading some docs again, creating an Ansible module, reading some docs again, and then reading some docs again and again. And this will make sense when we get to it. Submitting a pull request and reading some more docs, and then syncing your fork, which is less painful than the forking that we did before. So what do I know about Ansible? Not that much, but it's enough. So I know how to install Ansible. I know how to create and run Ansible playbooks, and you might think that that's a lot, but that's pretty much basic stuff. I know how to run Ansible in very, very, very verbose mode, so it will tell me this is where your mistake was, and as critical as your mistake was, it'll tell you a lot of stuff. I know how to write Python code. Now, Ansible can be written in other languages, but when you read the docs, it'll say, it's probably not a good idea because there's a lot of facility built around Ansible code that's written in Python, so you might as well just write it in Python. Python is best. That's what they say. That's not what I say. I mean, I do agree, but Python is best. I know how to use github.com, and I know how to use Git. And the, the number one tool for most programmers, developers, is I know how to Google, right? I know how to look up a loop, a thing, a syntax, or I know how to look up the code and figure out the code. And my advice when you Google code, because I'm not against Googling code, my, my, my advice when you Google code is that you know what that code does before you just stick it in your code, all right? And I know that we all, we all, look through the code before we, before we go ahead and use it. But that's what I know about Ansible. It's not that much, but it's enough. All right, oh, I went backwards. Okay, read some docs. Everybody wants to just do it. They just wanna sit down and contribute to Ansible. I'll read the docs later. I'll watch a video on YouTube. I'll read the docs later. So the docs are always over here. But I'm gonna say read some docs. Because the docs, look at this doc that they have out there, Ansible Module Development Walkthrough. This will tell you everything I'm gonna tell you today. Don't leave and go read the doc. Listen to me first, then go read the doc. But I'm gonna go through what, what's in the docs and how to utilize that to contribute to Ansible. So read some docs. And the reason I want you to read docs is so that this guy won't ugly cry. Some developer wrote these docs for you, and don't make these developers ugly cry. And this image right here, just so you guys know, 
or ladies, men and ladies, guys in, in a general sense. This is a true measuring meter, measurement meter, whatever you call it, guide, because I found this on the internet. So when you don't read the docs that someone wrote, it will hurt a whole lot, but it won't hurt that bad, all right? But it will hurt a whole lot to those doc writers. So that's a true measurement that we use or that doc writers use, don't make them ugly cry that you didn't read their docs, and then submitted a question to the, you know, the, the something room, whether it be Slack, probably Spark room it should be, but, you know, don't read the docs. All right, so fork Ansible on GitHub. Does anybody know what forking code on GitHub means? All right, so when you fork code on GitHub, and hopefully everybody knows what GitHub is. But if you don't, github.com, it's a source code repository. But when you fork Ansible, and the docs say to clone it, and I say fork it, but when you fork the code, you're actually going to the actual Ansible repository, the code that, that is out there for Ansible, and you are making a copy of that repository at that point in time. And it, that copy is connected to the original, but not updated by the original. So I have a nice graphic here to show you exactly what that means. So say, <laughs> this is the code. Mario and Luigi are Ansible, and then you fork it. Now you have a copy of Mario and Luigi Ansible in your repository. Ansible goes ahead and goes from 8-bit Mario and Luigi to 64-bit Mario and Luigi. You still have 8-bit Mario and Luigi, but you know about 64-bit Mario and Luigi. You know that something happened in that other repository, but you don't have it. You can sync your fork, and we're gonna talk about it at the end. So forking the code is you take a copy, put it into your repository under your account in Ansible, or in, in, in GitHub. It is still connected, because it's a known fork. However, it doesn't get updated by, but you, there is awareness of those updates. So fork Ansible. Now, forking Ansible is as simple as clicking a button in GitHub, and I have a graphic for that. The first step is to fork Ansible. The next step of setting up your development environment is clone your forked code, not the Ansible code, right? So, you're all with me now. We made a copy, and then we are cloning, so we're making another copy of our copy, but we're bringing it down to our local system. We're cloning it. We're going to set up a Python virtual environment in the Ansible directory that we have cloned from our fork. I'm, I hope I'm not saying it too much, but I want to stress it. We're going to activate the virtual environment. We're going to install the developer requirements. And then we're going to run the development environment setup script, right? So a couple of steps to set up your development environment. So forking Ansible from Ansible, you literally, there's a button that says fork, and you click it. Now once I click that fork button and the forking happens, it comes into my repository, my John A. McDonough Ansible repository, not Ansible, Ansible repository, so I forked that. Then I clone it, which means I bring it down to my development machine, whether it's, uh, whether it's my laptop, and I do do my Ansible development directly on my laptop, or it's an instance somewhere, a VM somewhere, but I clone that forked code down to my, my place. And then I run some stuff in my environment. I get cloned, so I'm copying my forked code down to my system. I switch into that directory, I set up a virtual environment, and if you're not familiar with Python virtual environments, it's a way to container, well, I don't want to say container, it's a way to compartmentalize your developments that you do. When you make this thing in this virtual environment, it has all the requirements and capabilities that that thing needs, and if you set up a virtual environment for some other thing, it has all the capabilities and requirements that that thing needs. So we clone it. We go into the directory, we run Python 3 or 2, you can use Python 2, and it's in the docs. We activate that virtual environment. So now we're sort of in this activation of that virtual environment and we're kind of separated out. We have our own copy of Python libraries, we have our own 
um, set of things for that specific thing that we're developing, in this case, Ansible. And then we run this thing called pip install requirements. So when you download the Ansible repository, you fork it, you clone it, or excuse me, you, you fork it, you clone it. Um, there's a file in there called requirements.txt, and that's a standard way that, or one of the standard ways that uh, Python packages or Python environments can be set up. There's a requirements.txt file, pip, install, read the things from the requirements. All these packages get installed into your virtual environment. It doesn't infect your actual Python deployment on your system. It's just inside that virtual environment. Oh, wrong way. And then the last thing you do is run the setup script, dot hacking slash env hyphen setup. So you'll see at my prompt at the very top there, it has a, a brackets, or excuse me, parens around it and says venv. Now that happens to be the name of my virtual environment, but you'll know you're in your virtual environment if you have that. So if we go back a step, you'll see I have my prompts on those other lines where it's just the name of my laptop and the directory that I'm in. But once I activate that virtual environment, it says, hey, you're in the virtual environment called VENV. So you'll know where you are, right? At this point, you are ready to develop some Ansible code on your laptop, or on your system, on your VM, wherever it may be. All right. Read some docs again. So one of the things I found out about reading docs is that if I go in and read the docs and I go through the process and I, I do the steps, I'm like, oh, that made sense. I, I guess that made sense. I think it made sense. I kind of know what that thing did. But then once I go through the process, if I go and read those docs again, oh, yes, that's what, I, that's what I'm doing. That's what I, I wanted to do. All right. And this guy's happy because you read his docs. It's funny. It's thank you. <laughs> Come on. It's funny. My wife says that if you have to tell somebody the joke is funny, it's not funny. And I'm pretty sure she's wrong. All right. So create an Ansible module. All right. Creating an Ansible module. Now, an Ansible module is that piece of code that, in this case, I've said Python, but you can create anything. But it's that piece of Python code that does or should do, and this is a suggestion from Ansible, it should do one thing well. It should be concise, right? Do one thing well. Turn a thing on, turn a thing off. Add an attribute, remove an attribute. Whatever that thing is, it should do that one thing well. If it's an object that can be created or updated or removed, that sounds like a good utilization or a good target for an Ansible module. One module, one object, create it, update it, remove it, Stuff like that. Modules shouldn't require, and this is an Ansible thing, right? Modules should be, um, or Ansible should be easy for the, for the end user. So they shouldn't require that a user know all the underlying options. I shouldn't have to know what all the potential possibilities are for uh, VLAN sharing if I'm writing a VLAN um, object uh, creation module or update module or delete module. I shouldn't have to know what all the options are for sharing. I should be able to look at the documentation of my module and see those options, but I shouldn't have to just know them in my head. The module itself will contain all the documentation for that module because you're going to put it in there. You're going to say, this is what the module does. You're going to say, these are the options in this module. These are the values for these options. These are the default values for this option. So if you have an option like description in the thing that you're creating, the default might be nothing. But if you have an option for, um, in this case, maybe VLAN, and the, and the default is that the sharing is public or, or whatever that might be, that might be the default. So your documentation in your module is going to tell them what that module does and what those attributes are, the settings or values that are available for the attributes. And modules should encompass much of the logic for interacting with a resource. So I've been referencing it, but you should think CRUD, create, update, create, read, update, delete. Those should be the things that your module does for that particular thing. So do one thing well. The user shouldn't have to know anything. They should be able to ask the module through the documentation aspects of Ansible what the things are about it. And then the, mo and the module should be 
you know, basically all the things that that object needs it to do. And if you think about it from a CRUD standpoint, then that's a good module to write. So now you're going to create an, oh, I'm going backwards. All right. So how do you create the Ansible module, right? So Ansible's pretty loose, right? You just, under your cloned code, you're going to change to the directory where you want to create your new module. You're going to create a file. You're going to use the new module development template. You're going to test the module locally and then with a playbook. And then you're going to create some unit tests. Well, that sounds like a lot of stuff. Well, you're going to read the docs because this is what tells you what the template looks like. There literally is a template. If you want to create a Python-based Ansible module, in the documentation there is a template. Copy that template. Use it as the foundation for your Ansible module. It shows you how to put in the metadata for Ansible, the documentation for Ansible, how to call the module or the import the modules that you need for Ansible. So this is even another uh, reason why you would use Python because this is written in Python. So it's a good place to start. Read the docs again. But then we have an issue. Because I'm reading these docs about creating a Ansible module, and I get to this part about going further. And this part says, if you would like to contribute to the main Ansible repository by adding a new feature or fixing a bug, create a fork. And I'm going to tell you, way at the top of this document, it said clone your code. And you've been doing stuff all along in clone code, directly from Ansible. And that's why I said fork it. Don't clone it. If you're going to contribute, you need to fork it. So then it says, create a fork of the Ansible repository and develop a new feature branch using the develop branch as a starting point. I'm going to say the guy that wrote this doc, or the gal, I'm going to be fair on both sides. Um, you left a little bit of info out, right? When you have good working code, Submit a pull request to the Ansible repository by selecting your feature branch as a source and the Ansible develop branch as a target. OK, now I'm, getting up, um, now I'm getting upset. If you want to submit new module to the upstream Ansible repo, be sure to run through sanity checks first. For example, this sanity check. And that's all it says about contributing to Ansible. That's, the, that's all it says. So I'm a little upset now. Because I just don't know what to do. Right. Follow my path. All right. You're going to submit a pull request. So now we got to go back to that Ansible module creation, and we're going to update it. We're going to change a little bit. Right. So the green is what we've added to what should have been in this documentation. We're going to CD to the desired directory, just like we did before, and we might create a new directory. However, however, be sure to read the docs because Ansible indicates in the documentation that they don't like more than two levels depth of directory. They don't like more than two levels. Create a new feature branch. So you have to use git checkout and the name of your feature branch. Create a new file. Same stuff again. Use the new module development template. Test the module locally and then with a the playbook. Create some unit tests. Oh, now we have to run some sanity checks. And what are sanity checks? Has anybody done any kind of um, Python Contri Python code contribution to any open source? All right, we got a guy back there. Sanity checks are PEP8 compliance. Are your lines longer than 79 characters? Did you use underscores in your variables? Did you, there's a whole bunch of things in sanity check. There is documentation about the sanity check and definitely I would recommend reading it. I don't want to scare you away from uh, Ansible contribution. However, this is the, get your feet wet kind of intro into it, but you will have to read some docs again. So you run the sanity checks, your code is cool, you like it, you commit, because it's GitHub, to your code, and you push your code to your feature branch, right? Remember, you forked it, you cloned it, and now you've got to commit it, but you're committing it to your code on your feature branch. 
and then you're going to submit a pull request. Now pull requests can only be submitted against one module. So in, in the sense of thinking about it, modules do one thing well. So when you submit a pull request to Ansible, you're saying take the code that I've created for this one thing that it does well and merge it. I want you to merge it into the Ansible production code, Ansible core, so that when somebody goes and downloads Ansible at the next rev, you, you can backport code, but I'm not talking about that. At the next rev of Ansible, the next release, they will get the module that you wrote for your product or for your thing that you're doing. So pull requests can only be, I mean, it's not like they can only be, like someone's going to say, hey, don't do that. It's a recommendation should only be submitted against one module. One feature branch per pull request. And this is how you create a feature branch, git checkout dash b, the name of your feature. That creates the feature branch. And then if you want to see the feature branches, you say git branch, and then you're doing that locally. When you say git checkout dash b and your feature branch, it will switch you to your feature branch, and git branch will show you that you are on that feature branch. Read some docs again, because there's a whole bunch of sanity tests out there. There's a sanity test for Ansible doc. Did your documentation in your module meet or comply with what Ansible wants you to have. There's an Ansible um, sanity test for line endings, for assertions, for base strings, for imports, for empty inits. There's all these sanity tests, because they don't want the code that you wrote that you think is 100% A-OK -okay, to not be in line with what they expect Ansible to be. So read some docs again. Oh. Then you submit a pull request. So this is my repository on GitHub, John A. McDonough slash Ansible, and I've made a change. And when I go ahead and compare and, uh, compare and pull request, you'll see that it's going to look at, if you look at the very top there, it says the base fork is Ansible slash Ansible. That's the Ansible core code that you download and run. And the fork that I want to merge into it is my fork and my my branch, my UCS NTP server branch. When you click that create pull request, it gives you a template. What does this do? Um, and there's also further down, I have a picture of it. You have to run a command to show the environment that it was developed in, tested in, and run against. And that goes into the pull request. And again, that's a, you know, that's a way for Ansible to ensure that you are doing things in the, in the guidelines of what they prescribe for an Ansible contribution. All right. So after you click that button to submit the pull request, automated testing will happen. And as good as you are as a developer, as good as you are, and I've been developing for 30 plus years, your code will fail. I'm going to say 100% without a doubt, someone might prove me wrong, please do. Your code will fail because of something. Because you didn't leave two spaces between, a, fun, between a, a method name in your module and the next method. There's so many things that happen. So all this automated testing happens. Your code will probably fail. Fix it, commit it, and push it again. Now when you fix it, commit it, and push it again, you don't have to create a new pull request because that existing pull request will be updated with your, um, your new code and the changes that you've made. And when your code is good, it will be merged, maybe. And there are reviewers and there are maintainers that need to approve your code. And they will recommend changes. And they will hurt your feelings, right? And you have to be tough skinned sometimes when you're dealing with the open source crowd. Because you know how all us developers are depicted as uh, introverted, you know, sitting behind our computers, all safe and secure? The moment we make a mistake, the moment you make a mistake, people are going to be like, you're the stupidest person who ever wrote a piece of code. And they're going to hurt your feelings. And I am talking from experience. And they will break you, and you will go crying to your spouse, partner, person. And they'll say, you just get back in front of that computer, and you write that code, John. <laughs> and you show them. I don't want to fall back into it, sorry. Um, so you make the changes that are, that are requested. And you commit it, and you push it. Automated testing happens. 
You don't have to um, submit a pull request again. I'm going to tell you on the last module I did that I thought was perfect the first time I clicked that pull request button, five times it came back to me from a reviewer. Five times. And I was like, are you serious? Are you serious? Yeah, they were serious. <laughs> Because they don't want junk. They don't want you to put stuff into their Ansible repository that is not up to their standards. And that's fair. And when you, when you submit to open source or when you contribute to open source, you've got to realize that they want what they did, the standards that they set, to be the standards that you adhere to. And your code is merged. And when looking for an image, I had to find the least offensive image that I could of a hooray, right? That wasn't a person. I didn't want to leave someone out. No, whatever. So anyway, so this squirrel is representing all us coders. <laughs> Your code is merged. OK, so this is what you did so far. You forked it. You cloned it. You created it. You sanity tested it. You created some unit tests. You committed it. I'm getting tired. You committed it. You pushed it. And then you submitted your pull request. It's a lot of stuff that happened. But now your fork, remember your fork? Remember it was 8-bit Luigi dreaming about 64-bit Luigi and Mario? You got to sync it. So to sync your fork, you have to, and this is locally where your clone is, you have to set what the remote upstream is. And the remote upstream is going to be the original, the original Ansible. You're going to fetch the upstream. So you're going to bring down the current Ansible repository, bring it down, fetch it. You're going to check out the, the main development branch for Ansible. You're then going to say, merge the upstream, the develop upstream, with my fork. Now, you don't see your fork name in here, but you're merging the current state of Ansible repository with your fork. And then you are going to take your fork, and I know this seems weird because your fork isn't named in there, and you're going to push to the devel origin in your fork. All right? And the reason you're doing this is because you're doing it all over again. You're forking, you're forking and, and syncing your fork because you want to go through that pain and anguish one more time and create your next module. So I didn't really ha I didn't have a conclusion slide, like a question slide. But if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them about contributing to Ansible. Um, the process is arduous sometimes. But if you have something, if you have an operation that you do, if you have something that you think somebody else would benefit from, if you want to make your product easier to administer, monitor, whatever it is that you want to do, um, Ansible may be able to help you in some way. I definitely think it's worthwhile to contribute to Ansible. It helps you grow as a developer because there's a lot of things that you'll learn by doing, doing this stuff. So thanks for coming. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Right. Thank you. Oh, question. Thanks for the presentation. It was really good. Um, question around the Python virtual environment, right? Is that persistent? Can you go back into that environment every time, or? Yeah, so I, don't, I didn't show it up here, but you can then. So say you're, you're, you're developing, and you have your Python virtual environment, and you're creating something for Ansible. But then maybe you have a Python virtual environment that you're doing for some other project you're working on. So once you activate that virtual environment, the way to get out of it is to deactivate it. Your prompt will go back to what it was before, and then you can go to another virtual environment and activate it. Or later on, if you come back to that Ansible stuff and you're picking it up again, you can activate and then run the, um, the environment setup script again, and then you're ready to go with Ansible again, ready to go with Ansible development. So it does persist. Well, all right. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, John. Awesome presentation. Thank you. All right. So at, at 2, we have uh, Hank Preston coming in to talk about building a net DevOps uh, continuous integration pipeline. So stick around. <laughs>